And now we'll hear Professor Emmanuel Candice uh, for his Lode show of the Gauss Prize winner, David Donahoe. It is a great pleasure to be here in Rio to uh, tell you and address this distinguished audience to tell you a little bit about the work of David Donahoe, the Gauss Prize winner. I would like to uh, start with a quote from uh, Francis Crick, the discoverer, along with Watson, of the double helix structure of the DNA. And he writes this, he writes, in my experience, most mathematicians are intellectually lazy and especially dislike reading experimental papers. This is a provocation. We're among friends. We can take a provocation and we can react to it. My reaction is very simple. Francis Crick has never met Donahoe. <laughs> the life of David Donahoe and the science of David Donahoe is the opposite of what Francis Crick describes. David is someone who informs himself constantly about everything, about science, about engineering, about policy making, about politics, about just about everything and he tirelessly tries to understand what people are doing successfully. And then he processes all of this and is basically developing very insightful mathematics, extremely deep theory that we can use and reuse. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, Dave is a scientist. Understanding is the goal of a scientist. But if I understand things better, then I can create new models for data that are better than the models that people use. I can create new processing algorithms. And then even perhaps more powerfully, I can take successful ideas and redeploy them in fields that have not been considered before. And so to tell you a little, give you a bit of taste about Dave's work, and I'm hoping that I will pick up your curiosity about what he has done, I'll make, we'll make three quick stops through three periods of his life. And the theme, which has been the theme of his life, essentially is the theme of sparsity. And so we're going to follow this theme. Our first stop is in the 90s, our early work of Dave on sparse signal recovery. And so um, what you should know is that immediately after college, uh, Dave was employed at a Western Geophysical, which is a US uh, company doing seismic experiments. And there he started to implement already at such a young age the program I outlined where he learned about seismic experiments, and he learned about how people were processing this data. He learned about the miraculous power of L1 methods. Now, what you see on the right is a slice of the Earth, showing you that sort of the Earth is like a layered cake, and seismologists want to know what this layered cake is made of. And so this is a very schematic view of what happens in reflection seismology. I've got a geophysical section of the Earth, and here, different colors indicate different layers, and they have different physical properties. And I try to know what they are. So what a seismologist does is we're going to propagate a sound wave down through the Earth, and each time the pressure waves encounters a discontinuity, then you're going to get back an echo. So mathematically, we can think about this as follows, and it's a simplification of reality. We have an object we care about, which is the jumps in physical properties when you go from a layer to another one. We have a pulse going down the Earth, and what the seismologist listens to at the surface of the Earth is roughly the convolution between this reflectivity coefficient and the pulse, the data you see on the right. Now, this has motivated uh, some of Dave's most spectacular work on sparse signal recovery, so just let's set the tone. We have a, a, a seismic trace, which we're going to call Y. It is a convolution of a pulse that we send down the Earth. And the object we, wish, we care about, the thing we want to image, the reflectivity function. It's a convolution. We need to perform a deconvolution problem. But if you look at the picture on the screen, we have a left picture showing you the time portrait of the pulse. On the right, we see the frequency portrait of the pulse. And something is striking immediately that the pulse does not have low frequency content. It does not have high frequency content. And so this is extremely challenging, because what it says is that this seismic experiment is missing both low and high frequencies. And that's problematic, because the object we care about recovering, this sparse spike train, has both low and high frequencies. So here is an early result uh, that Dave obtained with uh, Ben Logan. So let's take a model for this seismic experiment, where 
I'm going to assume that the kernel, phi, is actually killing all the low frequencies. All the frequencies below pi, you do not have them. But as we've seen, the reflectivity function, f0, is sparse. It's sparse in the time domain, and it has a support, capital T, which puts a mass on any Nyquist interval of length 1 of at most 1 over pi. That's a sparsity assumption. It's us knowing that what we want to recover is sparse. Then a very beautiful result is this, and a deep result is this. You observe the seismic trace y. You have no idea what f is. And to recover f, you're going to solve a very simple optimization problem. You're going to try to find among all solutions that with minimum L1 norm. And the spectacular results of Donahoe and Logan is that this works, that this recovers the unknown reflectivity function exactly. Now, this is a puzzling result. And I'm going to try to explain it differently and make some connections with things that you may have heard of. The puzzling result is this. You can think about it differently. I'm just restating what I've just said. We have a data now, which is a superposition of two things. One object, B0, which is band limited, and it has no frequency content above pi, and F0, which is our reflectivity function from before. And they're pictured on the graph. So we have F0 pointing upward. We have B0 in the subspace of band limited functions. And you see this is our problem. Because if I observe y, I have no information about the low frequency content of f0. So we observe y, and what the Donohue Logan result tells us is if I take y and I project it in an L1 sense over the space of band limited function, I'm going to recover b0. And so if I know the b0 part of y, I know the f0 part, and so I have exact recovery. Now, this is a very deep result that involves a lot of mathematical analysis. I can only pick up your curiosity, and I'll do a good job if when you leave this room you go and read about this. But what I want to, OK, so why does this work? Sorry. I can see that this doesn't work. It's a bit surprising that it works, because when I project y onto the space of band limited functions, I can see that I'm not recovering b0. But remember, we're doing a projection in an L1 sense. And the L1 geometry is very different from the L2 geometry. And if I find a point that is closest to y in that L1 sense, I do recover b0. It's a deep result. And hopefully, you can read about this. I think one thing I want to say before moving on to the next topic is that we all learn about Heisenberg and certain principle in, in, in college. And it's usually taught in a negative fashion that it's an impossibility to both know position and momentum at the same time. What Donohoe shows through his work, it's because a signal that is sparse in time cannot be sparse in frequency that I can do this miraculous signal processing, that I can actually demix a signal sparse in frequency and a, and a single sparse in time. OK. So it's a positive spin on the uncertain principle that you all know of. Our second stop, and I thought this would be appropriate for a country that has contributed so much to music, is in harmonic analysis. And so a previous uh, Gauss Prize recognized work in wavelet theory. And my goal is here is not to discuss wavelets. It has been done before. I'm just going to say that it's a system. It's an ortho basis. And you can represent any signal or images that you want with wavelets. So let's do that. Let's take a signal. And the signal here is my blue curve. And we can look at this signal through the wavelet prism and look at its wavelet coefficient. And as you can see, which is a t the plot on the top right, I've organized the wavelet coefficients by time, by location, and scale. And so we see a lot of coefficients that are very, very small. And then we see a few that are large, indicated by a, a, a large uh, a, a tick. People saw that wavelets were great because it gave us a time scale portrait of a signal. Donahoe saw something else. He saw sparsity. And so, when I compare the wavelet representation with the Fourier representation, which are two systems I can use to represent the same object, I can look at the coefficients in the expansion sorted by decaying order of magnitudes. And so you see the yellow curve and the, and the, and the red curve, both on a log scale, showing you that the wavelet coefficient sequence of this object decays much faster than the Fourier coefficient sequence. 
And this has tremendous consequences, not only for academic signals, but also for real life signals. This is a picture of Paris. And just to drive this point home, let's say that we want to represent the previous picture with both Fourier basis and wavelet basis. Because the wavelet basis, the wavelet coefficient sequence decay faster, what it means is if I truncate the expansion to only retain perhaps a 2.4% largest coefficient in the expansion, then I get much better accuracy. And so on your left, you see what we can do with Fourier analysis. On the right, you can see what you can do with the wavelets that were specially constructed by Ingrid Dobeschies. And so the fact, so Delnoho sees sparsity, and he understands that sparsity is going to have consequences for statistical estimation itself. So we're going to discuss the celebrated wavelet shrinkage algorithm of Donohoe and Johnstone. Here the problem is easy to describe. You have a signal Y, which is the sum of a clean signal that you wish to recover, and Gaussian noise, and you want to separate the signal from the noise. This is a primary task in almost all scientific and applications I can think of. So what do they do? They say, well, we're going to take this data and transform it into a domain where it expects sparsity, for example, the wavelet basis. And then I see the sort of coefficients table that we see over here. We see a lot of white noise, and we see daisies sticking out of the white noise. Right? So all I'm doing is I'm mapping the problem in a two new domain, where I have new data y lambda equal to theta lambda, which are the coefficient of the true signal plus white noise. And now we, net, we need to get rid of the weeds. And so to get rid of the weeds, we're going to perform, or they, Donohue and Johnson perform, a nonlinear shrinkage, which will, since we expect sparsity, will set a lot of these coefficients to zero in a nonlinear fashion. And so the algorithm is just taking the picture we see over here, sorry, the picture we see over here, comparing the values with the threshold, zeroing out everything thre below threshold, and then we get the estimate we see over here. Then once you have an estimate of the coefficient, I can invert the transform and reconstruct the signal. Now this algorithm has been used thousands of times in I don't know how many fields, in all fields that I can think of dealing with images and signals. Here I'm just showing you a picture taken from the fields of astronomy. Now, why does sparsity help so much? Well, let me give you a very an naive analysis of wavelet shrinkage. So we have these coefficients y, which have mean theta and variance sigma squared. And we have on the left the shrinkage algorithm of Donohue and Johnstone. Now, to show you why sparsity helps so much, I'm going to um, look at an ideal estimate, which is a bit different. It's the same keep or kill estimate. But now the decision made as to whether I should keep or kill the coefficients is based on a different rule. And it's based on whether the true coefficient uh, exceed the noise level or if they are below the noise level. Now you'd say, in practice, you could not use an algorithm like this. And you're right, because I don't know the coefficients. But the remarkable work of Donohoe and, and Johnson has shown in the 90s that we could actually tune the threshold of the real estimate to mimic the performance of the naive estimate. So we're going to take this as a proxy. Now, if we take the ideal estimate as a proxy, I can compute its mean squared error, which is a rough measure of performance of how well I'm doing, and I get something like this. The mean squared error, and it's an easy calculation, is going to be given by a formula which statisticians would recognize as sort of an optimal trade-off between bias and variance. It is given by the sum of the minimum between theta squared, the, the size of the true coefficients, and sigma squared, the noise level. Now, if we see the picture on the left, I have an orange curve, which shows you, the K, again, the coefficients ordered in a decaying fashion. And we have a black curve, which is the noise level. And what the estimator says is that how well you'll do is given by the red area, the area below the minimum of these two curves. Now, what does Enhance sparse, what does sparsity offer? Enhanced sparsity, well, the orange curve is going to decay faster, and therefore your performance will improve significantly. So this is to tell you that Donohoe saw sparsity everywhere. Here I'm showing you the cover of a very influential book in our field, um, written by Stéphane Mala. 
And if you look at the subtitle of the new edition, it says The Sparse Way. And that's really the triumph of Dave's ideas, realizing that we care about these transforms because they offer sparsity. Not only this, but Donahoe was so convinced that sparsity was everywhere that he encouraged all of us to look for sparsity. And there are people in machine learning, people in statistics, people in neuroscience, people in physics. Everybody is looking for sparsity in Dave's footsteps. My last stop is the compressed sensing story. Uh, it's a field that started around 2004. And so it's a picture of uh, Dave and his wife around that time, if I'm not mistaken. And to uh, tell you about compressed sensing, I think it's best for me to start with magnetic resonance images. When you go in an MR scan, then the scan is an indirect measurement process. And what the scan measures, it measures Fourier coefficients about yourself. So you go in the scan, you, you take a complete scan, so you, you measure the Fourier coefficients. And what the radiologist does, he presses a button or she presses a button, the machine inverts the Fourier transform and makes the pictures that you see on the left. So far, so good. The problem is that to acquire a full scan takes an em enormous amount of time, and that's a problem. And I'm sure Dave in his lecture will tell you why it's a problem. I'll just note that it's a problem for child pediatrics. We don't use MR so much for children because they move in the scan and because they move, everything is blurred. And so a primary goal of, of radiology is to speed up the acquisition time. Now, what does it mean to speed up mathematically? Mathematically, it means something very simple. You do not have the time to collect all the data. So you're going to have to only collect a few. And so speeding up means that now, instead of getting a full scan, all the Fourier coefficients, you're only going to get a partial view. And so you're only going to get some Fourier coefficients. And now you're going to have to solve what looks like a daunting problem, which is an undetermined system of linear equations. Now, completely inspired by Dave's work, um, uh, we did a surprising experiment in, uh, with, along with Justin Romberg and Terence Tao, which we took an image, um, which is an image people like in the field. Uh, it's a, called the Logan Shep Phantom. We, we simulated the process of acquiring a scan, and then we started to throw away most of what the scan had acquired. And then we per applied a classical reconstruction algorithm, and that did not give any good results, something that is completely unsuitable for medical diagnostics. But guided by David, when we thought, oh, my god, this, this phantom is, has a sparse gradient. L1 should be great. Then we got something unexpected, that the thing recovers this perfectly. And now we're touching the core of compressed sensing, which is one of uh, Dave's greatest achievements. He has written this very famous paper in which he says the following, that if indeed the world is sparse, if indeed I'm about to sense the sparse world, meaning that the number of degrees of freedom needed to characterize a signal is much lower than the ambient dimension suggests. For example, the number of pixels. Why do you bother getting all the information? Why don't you just get, acquire the part you need and not the part that you'll end up throwing away anyway? So this is the beginning of a revolution where we're beginning to think about new data sensing protocol where we say the following. I have a signal x. It is sparse. I should not try to measure it at every pixel. Instead, I should try to measure it after some sort of, I, I apply what we're going to call a sensing matrix. I should try to sample y, which is a times x. And the point here is that y is much lower dimensional than x itself. And if we do this, and if you listen to what I, I've been talking about, then when you're holding y, maybe there's not much loss of information. And to recover the signal x, you just solve an optimization program. Now, when does this work? Well, let's go back to geometry. This is my L1 ball, the, one, the ball you've seen a few times already, except it's in 3D now. And so you see I have a blue point, and that's my sparse signal. It's sparse because it's only a combination of E1 and E3. It does not involve E2. And then we have an object, other object, which is a plane, uh, which is a range of A. And so this blue point lies on a one-dimensional face of the polytope. And what you can do is you can apply a projection. And then two things will happen. When you project a polytope, you get a polytope. And if the blue point happens to be on the face of the polytope that is being conserved, 
that it is the face of the projected polytope, then L1 recovery will work. If it is not, then it will not work. And so in this case, we see that it doesn't work. But if it were on a red face, then it would work. And so basically, the whole story now becomes a question in, in uh, integral uh, geometry. Suppose that we take a sensing matrix, which has IID Gaussian entries, and I take it this way so that the range of A has uniform orientation. Then David has been able to leverage tremendous work done on counting the faces of projected polytopes. Uh, that was done in the 80s and the 70s and early 90s and polytope angle calculations to derive ex an exquisite picture of when is it that we can e expect this miraculous method to work and make them less miraculous in some sense. So I will cut the, to the chase. We have essentially two parameters. One is the amount with which I undersample. That's the y-axis. That's the undersampling ratio. The x-axis is the sparsity level. And so if you're on the left, you're very sparse. If you're on the right, you're not very sparse. And Donohue and Tanner were able to exactly characterize when we can expect this, showing that minimum L1 undergoes a sharp transition phenomenon. And we're able to characterize exactly when we can expect perfect recovery. So uh, my time is up, but I would like to compute, uh, conclude with perhaps just a few words. First, I want to come back to this pivotal person that Dave is in our field. People do scattered experiment, and somehow David, and it takes considerable time and energy, and it's not easy to do, looks at this experiment and builds theory and knowledge out of it. And it's not knowledge for the sake of knowledge or mathematics for the sake of mathematics. It's mathematics that will inform better practice. And what else can I say? But as an outcome of Dave's work, we have sparsity is informing the way uh, children are, are taking MR scans and is improving medical diagnostic in a very significant way. It's improving human health. The second is I followed, I really wanted to highlight Dave's achievement, but you should know that in my field, in statistics, in information theory, in applied mathematics, he has been a leading figure in many other ways. For example, he has a very broad intellectual leadership. Here we see a, a, a timeline of his time since PhD, about 35 years. I took three papers that he wrote, one on reproducible research, one at the occasion of this conference, Mathematics for the Millennium, which was held at UCLA in 2000, and one, 50 years of data science. And if you read what this is about, this is about reproducible research, the oncoming age of big data, and data science. These are all buzzwords now, but they were not buzzwords when they, David looked at them. And so what I think he has done here, which is so important for our communities, is to s take this field and establish an intellectual agenda for this. And so, for example, you may have heard about data science at your own university. It's a hot topic now. But David is encouraging us to think about data science as an intellectual pursuit. How do we make sure that it's just not a collection of tools, but something of a science, something with an intellectual agenda that is worth pursuing? I took too much of your time. So I will not bother repeating myself. What I'll just say is that uh, Dave was my advisor, and I got a great start because of him. And that's probably the reason I'm here. And with this, I'd like to thank you very much. <laughs>